as everybody else has said, it's a pleasure to be here. and Thank you for the invitation. Um, very much enjoyed the talk so far this morning and looking forward to the um, rest of today and tomorrow. Um, I should also perhaps say that Tim isn't joining me to do the performance. I've sacked him from our duo, which has been, we've been running for 10 years now as of today, and Tom Powells is replacing him um, to do the performance this afternoon. Tim's doing his um, concert this evening, so he's got to prepare for that. So I haven't really sacked him. Um, so uh, I, I realised kind of rather foolishly uh, during the talks this morning that I should have talked about some of the distributed work I've been making, which really does involve quite a lot of um, uh, participation. And rather foolishly, I've chosen some pieces which are perhaps less clearly participatory, but um, I think it still works. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so one of the things that interests me is the way that we regularly coordinate, co coordinate our actions in groups. And there's lots of you know, different daily situations where this happens. Um, the last couple of weeks I've been on jury service in the UK, um, which has been quite an interesting experience. Um, the idea of having to come to a consensus with a group of uh, 11 other people who you've never met before, um, um, for, with very serious consequences obviously, um, was quite uh, uh, su surprising in many different ways. Um, some recent research on the uh, distribution of votes before deliberation and then the impact on the final outcome of a, of a jury's um, uh, deliberation I think shows some of the ways that these behaviours can, can emerge. So this is a, a sort of a, a summary of the outcomes of particular trials based on the original views of juries before they engage in discussion. Um, so in the majority of cases, so if all 12 people think someone's guilty, then that's generally the result. Bizarrely, there are situations where all 12 people go in thinking someone's guilty and then they're not guilty, which I can't imagine how those discussions work. Um, and then um, the opposite as well. But it's those, it's those intermediate positions where you have perhaps um, uh, majorities of 10 to 2, 9 to 3, 8 to 4, and so on. Um, and generally where people are thinking the original view is not, not guilty, that tends to be the outcome um, more commonly than if um, the outcome is, uh, the view is, is guilty. So the way that groups interact in these situations um, is quite complex, as you'd imagine, and not necessarily predictable or patterned. Um, but um, some situations like this, I love this picture, this was taken at a recent Ed Sheeran concert um, in the UK, and it shows some uh, people queuing, you can see to the left of the picture, that um, they're nicely ordered because of the barriers, but all of the, the group to the right, um, there's no barriers there. They've just um, autonomously chosen or worked out as a group to queue in this very ordered way. It may something, say something about British audiences or Ed Sheeran fans, I don't know, but um, it's, this is a, a, a behaviour that comes from individual decision-making. And then just finally... Um, Wandering around um, Ghent today has been lovely, seeing lots of um, cafes. Obviously, nobody's sitting outside them at the moment because it's so cold. But um, often you're faced with a decision as to um, when you're, you have lots of different restaurants you can go into, all of which look equally appetising, which one do you go to? Um, do you select the busy restaurant because it's obviously popular, or do you go to the empty one because you're more likely to get served? And um, in Banerjee's 1992 study, a simple model of herd behaviour, he notes that there are innumerable social and economic situations in which we are influenced by decision making, in our decision making, by what others around us are doing. Perhaps the commonest examples are from everyday life. We often decide on what stores and restaurants to patronise or what schools to attend on the basis of how popular they seem to be. We set up a model in which paying heed to what everybody else is doing is rational because their decisions may reflect information that hey, they have and we do not. And these kinds of herd behaviours lead to um, what easily and Kleinberg call an information cascade, um, which has the potential to occur when people make decisions sequentially, with later people watching the actions of earlier people and from these actions inferring something about what the earlier people know. So the example in the picture there of everybody looking up, it's almost impossible to walk past a group of people staring at something in the sky and not look up yourself. It's kind of ingrained into us a little bit. So these kinds of approaches, um, these kind of situations in everyday life, are things that I find quite useful as a compositional strategy. And my work from the last um, five or six years, really, has explored these in different ways. Um, and I think there's three particular ways that I'm interested in doing this. Firstly, as a way to organise sounds. I'm interested in how um, individual decision-making might um, map out onto the, um, a group and the way they interact to produce an ordering of sounds which is otherwise unordered in advance of the composition being performed. Um, secondly, and I think this is perhaps a little bit more contentious, um, it's as a way to 
I think, present the performers as themselves. And I think that in itself is a very difficult thing to say. You know, I'm sitting here on a, on a stage in front of people, um, and according to my um, watch, my heart rate is probably slightly higher than it would normally be. Um, I'm not perhaps behaving in a normal way. Um, but trying to, in, in these pieces, create a situation where it's removing some of the, the more theatrical approaches to how they might present the work and, and making more natural decisions, I suppose, as part of the performance practice. Um, something to talk about perhaps later. Um, but also as a way to, the thirdly, to, as a way to, I hope, translate these sorts of situations um, that happen in the pieces into the way we um, experience um, relationships in everyday life. And there's a sort of empathy, I hope, that comes from, from that ap approach. So my starting point for this has been to work with, um, to consider this from the perspective of, of rules. We talked a bit about rules um, earlier and, and games in particular because I think there's, there's something that translates very well from these um, environments into, into, into score making. Um, uh, Jesper Juhl, um, a Danish uh, uh, games uh, scholar, identifies six different aspects of games um, the first four of those are quite, kind of quite, quite obvious things. They have rules, um, variable and quantifiable outcomes. There are values assigned to, po um, to possible outcomes, and there's a player effort. And those largely constitute the actions of, of the game itself, the playing itself. But the things that interest me, I think, are, are, are points five and six. Um, the player attached to an outcome and the fact that there are negotiable consequences. So you might imagine the situation, kind of the cliched situation of a poker game where there are people um, kind of around a uh, smoky table at night in a back street bar. Um, one player wins all the other players' money. And within the context of the game, that's absolutely fine. Um, but, of course, the players are all attached to that outcome outside of the game itself. Somebody's walking off with their money. And um, to follow the cliché through even further, um, the negotiable consequences might um, be enacted once the person leaves and meets the associates in the alleyway outside. So some games, although they have this, this closed world within a, wor within a um, world, as Husinger would say, um, some of those behaviours actually uh, really mean something outside of that, that sort of safe, safe environment. And I think there's analogies there between musical performance as well. Um, recent research by Mary Flanagan and Hen Helen Nissenbaum also considers the, um, the idea of values in games and the way that rules encode these sorts of values. Um, so they talk about the values in American football as being violence, antagonism, territoriality, cooperation and teamwork. And they argue that all of these Im values emerge from the rules of the game and any combination of them might contribute to the player's experience of the game's values. Precisely how players or spectators experience the values of football depends on the unique combination of personal, cultural, and situational factors that they bring to the game. And I think if you think about a sport, I'll, I'll use kind of um, soccer, uh, not American football, as an example, because I know it better. Um, the, the, the values there, which are similar, are coded into the rules of the game such that if you change the rules, um, the values change. So, for example, if you um, instigated a rule where instead of two teams on a football pitch, there were five smaller teams, how would the sense of territoriality, teamwork and cooperation change as a result of that? Equally, if you produced a penalty for any physical contact whatsoever, then the sense of violence and antagonism as a value that emerges from football might change. So the sorts of ways that we, we kind of relate to these, um, these frameworks changes depending on the way the rules interact with our, with our understanding of them. Um, but also, um, someone like Ian Bogos takes this a little bit further. Um, and he uses, uh, sees games, he's a um, video game uh, scholar, um, sees games as a more forceful space for change. Um, and he introduces the idea of procedural rhetoric, which is the practice of using processes persuasively. Um, and he makes links between um, processes in games and art and processes in the material world and seeks to sort of find instances of their intersection. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting for music, um, particularly score-based performance music, which is the sort of background that I come from and the, the work I make, um, he talks about the difference between board games and video games, or analog games like board games and card games and video games. In the board games, they tend to be uh, human-enacted processes. So um, if, you, if you're learning a board game for the first time, you'd either read a rule book 
or you'd ask somebody to explain it to you, or you'd watch other people playing it, and you'd learn the rules that way. But when you play the game, you enact the rules in your, in your mind or through discussion um, yourself. The game doesn't necessarily do that for you. There's always exceptions, of course. Whereas in video games, um, although there are tutorial levels, and um, you can still watch and learn through watching other people play, um, which my children seem to do incessantly, watching YouTube videos of other people playing computer games, um, but it's the software itself that encodes a lot of the interaction and you just sort of respond to the, the information that's presented to you. So it's the difference between human inactive processes, which for me are more similar to scores, and system inactive processes. Um, but he thinks of uh, procedural representation as explaining processes with other processes. So there's a link there, I think, between processes in the world and processes within these more closed environments. Um, and then Karen Schreier, uh, again writing in uh, the Nissenbaum and Flanagan book, um, talks about games and other designed experiences which may provide a necessary window, window into how other systems, such as cultural or political systems, can also affect how we interact with other people and institutions or value certain objects, roles or behaviours differently from others. So I think games can, can communicate values and enact persuasive processes in this way um, and potentially just ch change perspectives. So my interest, as I mentioned at the beginning, is in the way groups uh, interact to, uh, within, within composition situations in particular. Um, and uh, uh, Donaldson Forsyth, who's an American um, psychologist, uh, says this is a, a psychology textbook, in fact, but a very useful summary of, of group dynamic processes, um, talks about group dynamics as the influential interpersonal processes that occur between groups over time. Um, and he outlines five different processes. I think the, the link here is nice with uh, Michael Nyman's 1974 um, notion of a people process. It sort of takes that a little bit further and goes into it with five more, more detailed versions. Um, I'm aware that Julia's staring at me for, for time, so I'm not going to kind of read through all of those for the moment. But essentially, formative processes are how um, groups are formed initially. Um, influence processes, how groups reduce the individual agency and control within a group, the way you might change the way you behave in a group as to um, on your own. Um, performance processes are specifically related to task focus activities where you're trying to achieve something within a group, coming to a decision in a trial, for example. Um, conflict processes, anyone we're all used to conflict within groups for various reasons, competition, lack of resources, because we don't like people. Um, and then contextual processes, so where a group operates. So, for example, whether you're making a decision in a jury room or halfway up Mount Everest tied to five other climbers, um, the way you, those contexts change how you make decisions. Um, but that framework, I think, is something, I'm, I'm kind of at the start of some of this, but it's something I'm going to take, take forward a little bit more. So what I want to do is play and talk about um, a, uh, probably a couple of groups of pieces that I've been making over the last few years, which deal with these sorts of behaviours. And linking that to the focus of what we're, we're discussing here um, about participation, um, some of these pieces are participatory in an obvious sense, in that the audience are involved and others um, more um, empathically, hopefully. We'll come to that. Um, so the first of these groups of pieces is a series called Things to Do that I started in 2014. And there's about 13 or so pieces in the series now. And they all operate in the same way. Um, there are a number of categories, uh, which are things like noises, pitches, recordings, processes, um, each of which has uh, a certain um, numerical uh, number of those elements. So um, there could be 10 noises, seven pitches, or whatever. Um, so there's sound producing materials, which some of the players within the performance have access to. There are also spoken cue words. So for example, if somebody says noise four, then the players who are responding play their noise four sound. Um, but the pieces differ based on the permutations of who gives cues and who, who responds to cues. Sometimes it's the same people, sometimes it's different people, and sometimes those roles might change during the piece. Um, the thing that interests me in, in working this way is it allows very controlled situations of, of social behaviour to be kind of um, exposed, I suppose, would be the best word, and to see how the performers react in those particular situations. Um, was, there was discussion about ethics of performance earlier, which might be something to talk about perhaps later. Um, I'll show you a few of the examples because this will, this will make it a bit clearer. So the first of these, um, they're all verbal scores, like the one here. Um, I think you better read that. It's quite big for once. <laughs> um, 
and uh, they all work in pretty much the same way. Preparation, so the players find a list of um, a, a, a selection of materials to make sounds based in these particular categories to determine how many there will be, and then they, they um, go and perform the piece. So in this, this version, you say what to do. Um, it's for a single player who only makes sounds, doesn't give any cues, and then a group of audience volunteers who only give cues and don't make sounds. So you get a group of people controlling one person. And in the performance, you'll see an excerpt from there are two instances of that happening simultaneously. Um, uh, I, I won't say any more. Here we go. Um, I should say, although it was audience volunteers, obviously not all of the people were audience volunteers because I was one of the people and there was at least two other composers involved. Um, but that was just a, a, a situation that emerged on the day. This was at Spore Festival in Denmark about three years ago. Um, you probably spotted a couple of interesting behaviours there. The, um, the lady on the left with the grey hair is leading for leaning forward slightly. Um, in the beginning of the piece, just before this excerpt, she started by essentially screaming a load of instructions at Mark Noop um, to the point where nobody else knew what to do. It was this sort of tirade of um, kind of instructions, which was a little bit unexpected, uh, unexpected, and we just all froze for a moment. And then there's this lovely moment on the, and, uh, the on the group in the in the group in the right. Um, there's the man and the woman in the middle who are a couple. I think um, spent most of that excerpt telling um, uh, Serge to turn something on and turn it off in this very polite sort of domestic argument which went through. Um, so these little moments started to emerge. Um, the thing which I found surprising also was that um, the two groups started to listen to what each other were doing. So if one person said a cue, then the, somebody in the other group might do that as well. So these sorts of little um, moments start to emerge. And that's one of the things that I find interesting working this way. It um, allows people to uh, develop strategies and tactics, some of which might be um, a little bit more aggressive, others might just be more natural in the way they are, behave. Um, the titles of these gradually get longer, I think, through the series. Um, this is a slightly different version. This is sometimes we do what you say, but occasionally we don't. Um, and this is for a group of uh, players who um, are on a stage, and there's four music stands at the front, um, and uh, audience members can come up from the audience, so they can actually stand up and walk to the front and give instructions from the, from the stands, and also members of the ensemble can also walk up to the stands, but the ensemble members don't give any cues at any other point. Um, it's been performed in a few ways. Oh, the other thing to say also is occasionally the, the ensemble can just refuse to, to make any sound, so they just kind of sit there crossed, with their arms crossed. Um, this performance, which was in Leeds last year, is a little bit more um, confrontational than I'd imagined. Um, it's since been done in a much more friendly, smiley sort of way in a smaller space. Um, so here we go. <laughs> Recording three on. P. 
pitch ten. Recording three off. Pitch ten. 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 Pitch six. Pitch ten. Pitch six. Noise nine. Device three off. Noise one, pitch four. Device two on. Recording one, recording two on. Noise seven, pitch eight, pitch one, pitch seven, pitch five. Device one on. Device one off. Recording three on. Noise three. Noise three. Noise three. Noise seven. Noise three. Noise three. Pitch nine. Pitch one. Pitch one. Pitch seven. Pitch eight. All devices off. Noise six. Pitch ten. All recording is on. Noise six. Noise four. Pitch two. Stop it there for the moment, just for reasons of time, but you get the idea. Um, so you can see the way that people start to come up and, and, and play with the ensemble in a way. Um, and then just the third, third version, just to show you, this is all the things we make you do um, from about a year and a half ago. Um, and this was performed by the third guy, who I think are a Brussels-based ensemble, um, in a situation similar to the one we've just seen. So the two players on stage only make sounds, but the audience can shout out instructions from their seats, in, a, in this case in a darkened room. It turned out to be a very darkened room because the power failed about seven minutes in and most of it was in the dark for the rest of the performance. Um, so, but, so the difference between these three pieces is the, the selection or the, 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 um, the way that the audience get involved in the first piece. They're, they sort of approached and asked to play. Um, in the second piece, they uh, self-select, they choose of their own volition to come and join the group. And in the third version, they can just participate as they want to. They can just kind of shout out. Uh, here's a short example. <laughs> Pitch two. Pitch two. Position three. Pitch two. Process one on. Device two on. <laughs> Recording one. <laughs> Recording two on. Position four. Recording four one on. Position one. Position two. <laughs> Device three off. Pitch one. Pitch one. <laughs> Pitch one. Recording three on. Position four. <laughs> Position three. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop there because of time, but you'll get, you get the idea there. If you want to see any of those, they're up on my website, if you want to see the full pieces. Um, so the things I'm exploring in these are the way that different groups exert power on each other, the way that um, people make decisions and respond to decisions and do that in different ways. Um, so just a little uh, schematic summary of some of those examples, um, uh, some of those you've seen. Uh, oh, actually, one of those pieces I didn't play today. That's interesting. Um, 
Uh, so everybody do this as a, a many-to-many -many relationship. I tell you what to do where one person tells a whole group is a one-to-many. Um, the piece I showed you, you say what to do, many-to-one, and so on. There's various combinations of these. So these, these so diagrams, I think, perhaps explain that a little bit. Um, so obvious audience interaction and participation in those sorts of pieces. Um, the other piece I wanted to show you um, before Tom and I do something is a piece from 2015 called All Voices Are Heard. And for me, and hopefully with the, the piece that Tom and I do in a moment, um, it's this sense of empathy, which I think is something I'm trying to um, promote in the pieces. Um, the sense that as audience members, we participate in some sense by um, imagining ourselves in the position of the performers going through what are at times quite complicated um, feats. So in this piece, All Voices Are Heard, um, it takes the idea of consensus decision making, um, where a group has to come to a decision where everybody is at least um, uh, happy or accepting of the outcome. Um, sorry, I've got a couple of quotes there which I won't read through now for time reasons. Um, so the way the piece works is um, all of the players have access to the same resources. So that could be the same list of words, it could be um, a set of the same objects or a mix of the both, both as you'll see in the example in a second. Um, and the aim is to create sequences of sound where everybody ends up playing the same thing in the same order in as near unison as possible. And they do this through producing a, a set of sequences. So in the first sequence, everyone just makes a load of sounds, words from the list that they can use, and then they stop. And then everyone individually makes a decision. They either do the same thing again, individually. They try and do something similar to what somebody else did. Um, they can do something entirely different, so an entirely new set of sounds, or they can stop completely. And if they stop, they step out of the process and they have to wait until it's complete. They all have the same aim, which is to, for all of them to end up doing the same thing. So whatever decisions they make have to be with that in mind. Um, so here's a, a short example. This takes about four minutes or so. Um, this is from a performance we did in Bath. Um, and I would perhaps draw your attention to the um, performers on the left of the screen as the piece progresses.
Okay, and then we go on to another one. Um, I've seen this film quite a few times now, and it, they never get it right, <laughs> still. Um, but it get close enough, I guess. Um, I'm just aware of time, so I'm just going to kind of wrap this up a little bit. Um, one of the things that I, I suppose I'm trying to do is, is use these ways to, as I mentioned at the beginning, to do three things. Firstly, to organise sound, so you can see in the, the way that the, the pieces have been performed, at the beginning, it's a pool of material. There's no ordering provided. It's just the relationship between players or the task at hand that creates the, um, the sequence and the combination of sounds in particular ways. Um, I think I'm hoping in some of these pieces, particularly the one that we've just seen, where it's, where it's quite difficult at times, um, performers are trying to do this task and they're so focused on that. Um, the load um, placed on them to do that... Uh, Really makes them not so 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 aware of their their sort of stage stage presence perhaps, um, and it's my hope with with some of these pieces certainly with you know when you see somebody who isn't quite managing to do it you just want them to do it there's a sort of a frustration there I suppose, and the idea of trying to be in the the position of those people to imagine yourself that sort of empathic response is something I'm hoping to generate a little bit with these these ways of working. Um, so I think perhaps if Tom and I have a go at this, this piece now, um, I'll just say a little bit about it as just while well, we're setting up. Um, so this is called In Which One, Things De One Thing Depends on Another um, and uses the principle of cognitive load as a way of disrupting the performance to make it harder for us. Um, so cognitive load has often three three uh, components. Firstly, the intrinsic cognitive load, the inherent complexity of the task. So you have a number sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's easier to remember than a more complex number series, like the one on the right there, 3.954 and so on. The extraneous con cognitive load is how information is presented. So one, two, three, four, five, six is easier to remember perhaps than four, six, one, three, two, five, although that's Again, not a particularly different se difficult sequence to, to remember, but you can imagine that scaling up. And then the germane cognitive load, which is the, um, the way you might develop uh, patterns or processes as a way of understanding what um, the sequence might be. So in the bottom example there, um, a sort of a, what looks like a sort of pattern sequence, but it, it may not be, is uh, once you know that the alternate terms are plus three, so one, four, seven, ten, or plus five, three, eight, um, 13, 18, and so on, it's 
easier to remember and to work out what that sequence is. So cognitive load is the amount of mental effort that's required by the working memory to understand a particular situation, to, to, to remember things. Um, so the piece that we'll do now um, is an attempt to sort of disrupt that slightly and make it harder for us. So we have a piece where um, we both have 10 objects and 10 words, and the role, of, the aim of the piece is for us to um, associate my 10 words with Tom's 10 objects and for Tom to associate his 10 words with my 10 objects, and we have to teach each other that those in a um, helpful way and um, then test each other to ensure we can do it. Um, we've not rehearsed this, <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Watch banana cocktail cocktail train banana cocktail banana yeast banana watch watch train
train. Fastest. Milk. Milk. Polenta. Polenta. Yeast. Flour. Yeast. Flour. Milk. Eggs. Eggs. Strain. Eggs. Strain. Basket. Popcorn. Popcorn. Watch. Eggs. Watch. Eggs. Basket. Computer. Computer. Watch. Uh, cocktail. Computer. Cocktail. Watch. Helicopter. Helicopter. Pencil. Computer. Computer. Basket. Computer. Helicopter. Grass. Grass. Um, computer. No. Computer. Glass. Grass. Train. Cocktail. Watch. Train. Watch. Cocktail. Basket. Pencil. Computer. Train. Glasses. Cocktail. Basket. Popcorn. Popcorn. Banana. Watch. Train. Banana. Banana. Popcorn. Cocktail. Basket. Pencil. Computer. <laughs> Helicopter. Glasses. Grass. Soup. Yeast. Milk. Cleanser. Eggs. Sugar. Water. Water. Molasses. 